He was the kind of guy that if you brought him home to meet your parents, they would just start weeping uncontrollably right in front of you guys. He he would be the he he's the kind of guy that that didn't fit in with society. He 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 didn't look the part and he had no desire to act or look or 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 be civilized that wasn't what he was called to i mean he said what he thought from the get go whatever was on his mind that's what was brought out he he wasn't concerned about what people thought about his appearance what people thought about what he ate what people thought about where he lived he only had one concern and and, and he, so he he spent most of his life outside of town some of the civilized would be repulsed by his appearance, by what he ate, by where he lived, and some of his words. Others would be inexplicably, you know what I'm starting to say, inexplicably drawn to it. So some, some of the civilized would, would somehow be inexplicably drawn to the baptizer, as they called him. See, John the Baptist was not your ordinary person. John the Baptist was a weirdo. He never cut his hair. He wore camel uh, fur for his, for his uh, clothing, and he ate locusts and, 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 and things like that in the, in the wilderness where he lived. He didn't live in town. He was apart from town. He didn't want to be associated with society. He had a different purpose, a different calling, and he was preparing the way for Jesus Christ. That's right. We get to hear about John the Baptist today, one of the weirdest people in all of the New Testament. I mean, and that's saying something because there's some pretty weird people in the New Testament. But John the Baptist's life was a parable. His entire life, all of his ministry was a parable from God. This would happen sometimes with prophets. Prophets would sometimes, uh, the actions in which they lived their lives, the things that they would have to do would be a parable, would, would, would bring home a point of what God was trying to say. If you don't believe me, turn to Isaiah chapter 20. Not right now, but if you want to at some point, go ahead and, and read it for yourself. It wasn't unusual for, for prophets to do this. Isaiah once, in, in um, Isaiah chapter 20, he had to prophesy naked or nearly naked down to his, at least his whitey tighties, right? Uh, for, for three years. For three years, he had to prophesy around in, in either, either stark naked or or just wearing the loincloth for three years. And it was, it was to prove a point. It was to emphasize something that God was trying to get to the people of Israel. Ezekiel once put on a whole battle, put a whole battle together against a, a, a brick that he had inscribed Jerusalem on. I mean, <laughs> like full, full assault on, on, on this brick just to prove a point. Right after this, he, he was to lay on his side for over a year. I think it was like 390 days. He had to lay on his, on his left side for over a year. And while he spoke, then he turned and, and went to the right side, I think for like 40 days or something like that. He, 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 right after that, he had to eat food prepared over burning dung, some bread that was made over burning dung to prove a point. See, it was, and you can read that in Ezekiel chapter four if you want to. It's, it's crazy and it's messed up, but sometimes God would use these people to do things to make a point. John had separated himself from society. His lifestyle was in stark contrast to those uh, who, whose pursuit of fame, money, possessions, and, and, and all these trivial pursuits of, of what make life. John separated himself from all of those things. And John was calling people in this time and to us uh, out of our life of pleasure, self-seeking, self-kingdom building lives that we have and into the wilderness of repentance. His whole life, an image of like, man, all of this stuff is worthless. Come out here to the wilderness of repentance and you will find living water. We're going to be in Luke chapter 3 today. I'm excited about this passage. I'm excited about every passage. I'm excited that I get to preach the Bible every single week, week in and week out. And so if you have a Bible, you're going to turn to Luke chapter 3, uh, and we're going to start in verse 1. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor over Judea, and Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip, tetrarch of the region of Iturea, and Trachonitis, and Lysanias, of, uh, tetrarch of Abilene. 
Ooh, that was tough. During the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. So right here, we've got, we've got the background on the culture of what's happening around them. Okay, so, so he lists off a whole bunch of people. Luke is lifting off, listing off a whole bunch of people saying, this is where it is. This is what's happening. This is the culture, the climate that's going on around John the Baptist, all right? Notice it doesn't start with once upon a time because this isn't a fairy tale. This is real life. Now, John the Baptist might look like a character out of some sort of crazy book, but he's not. He was a real person on this earth doing real things at a real time. And, and, and these two verses just show that. Here's the political climate during this time. We've got Tiberius, uh, who, who, who is Caesar at this point. He wants to enforce Jews. And these are not great political people. These are not people who have the Jewish people's interests at heart, all right? He once enforced all the Jews in Rome to be in the military, and he banished the rest of, of the Roman Jewish population uh, on pain of enslavement for life. They, they were going to be enslaved for life. He, he banished all of the rest. If you weren't going to be in military service, you were banished. You were out. Because they were growing in numbers. That's, that was the reason why. Pontius Pilate, he had a brutal massacre of Jewish people in Judea. And we all know about Pontius Pilate, right? We're going to find out a little bit later on. He plays a pretty significant role in the death of Jesus Christ. There, there, and there's these rulers from the family of Herod the Great, Herod, Philip, and uh, Lysanias. They were, they, they were known for their cruelty and corruption. And then you have the religious leaders. He even goes as far as to list the religious leaders. The high priest is, is, is Caiaphas and his, I, I want to say it was his uh, um, uh, father-in-law, An- An- Anas. Uh, yeah, his father-in-law. More, they were more interested in political power than serving God. That's what had happened to the high priest throne. They were, they were, or, or position. They were more interested in having political power than than serving God. Everything had gotten flipped upside down. And, and some of us might today think think about the political climate that we're in, think about the cultural climate that we're in, and, and man, we just have to understand that God still works in times of political and social unrest. In fact, I dare say God does his best work in times of political and social unrest. So if you are not ready, be prepared for God to do a great work soon. He's already starting, hopefully, in your heart. There's a stirring in your heart. We've seen that over and over and over again in in that rebuild series. uh, Ezra and Nehemiah, Nehemiah specifically, had a stirring in his heart to go back to rebuild what was broken. That stirring in our hearts, are we listening to the Holy Spirit? Are we listening to what he has for us? Are we listening to to that voice saying, go, be a a part of my plan, Uh, make disciples? Are we listening to that stirring? of the spirit because God is working in this time of of political social cultural unrest you may look out at the at the landscape of of, of maybe politics or or of the culture and just see a wasteland just be like oh my goodness how in the world are we going to do this how in the world can we repair relationships how in the world is God going to work through all of this and we just have to look at this story See where they're at here politically. See where they're at culturally. See the things that are going on. And see that that's the world that Jesus was brought into. God is still at work in times of political and social unrest. Unrest. This is basically the Middle East of Gotham. (laughs) Right? Batman? I don't know why I make so many Batman references. Like, I'm not a super fan, but it just reminded me there's corruption. There's a whole bunch of stuff going on, political corruption, um, uh, uh, a lot of bad stuff. It just reminded me of Gotham City, and you just need, need somebody to come in. Like, this is the Middle East Gotham, and this is the climate. This is the area in which John the Baptist comes into, and Jesus. And he went into all the region around the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. So this is John the Baptist, the son of Zechariah. He's living in the wilderness. He, he, he doesn't want to be a part of what's going on. He's separating himself out. He is living a holy life. He is literally separating himself from the culture around us. And maybe a couple of us could take a couple notes from that and be like, man, maybe I should just take a, a little sabbatical from, from the culture around me. 
right? But he, he goes into all the region around the Jordan proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Now this, 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 this word repentance, we know about repentance, right? It's, it's when, we, when, we, when we ask forgiveness of our sins, right? It's, it's when we, we come to Jesus and we repent, we, 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 uh, we ask forgiveness, right? No, no, no. Repentance is an action word. Some of us get this idea that, that it's, it's just the feelings of feeling sorry for our sins. Like we feel bad, so I'm going to, I'm going to repent. Repentance is like just what happens when you feel bad, right? No, a baptism of repentance means fully immersing yourself into repentance, this act of repenting, which means turning from, from one thing and turning to another. So when we repent of our sins, it means that we are literally turning away. I don't know if it's literally. We are literally turning away from our sin to Jesus Christ. We're saying we are done with sin and our actions are proving that we are repenting from our sin. We are moving on from our sin. That's what repentance is. It's an action word. There's, there's things that are followed up by this. Repentance for the for- forgiveness of sins. It's a ba- proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. It, it, repentance is Romans 12, 1 and 2, right? Uh, do not be conformed to the patterns of this world. But be renew, but uh, be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you will be able to test and approve what what the will of God is, His good and perfect will. That that's repentance. That's the renewing of the mind. That's not just being like, oh, I'm sorry about doing this. I fell into a rut again. I did this thing again, man. I fell into sin again. I did this. Oh man, I just I just I fell into it. I tripped into it. It wasn't my fault. No, take ownership of what we're doing. Take ownership of the sin that we have in our lives and turn from it. Renew our minds. Take action steps. Join a community group. Get involved in some sort of uh, uh, addiction meeting. Uh, make people hold you accountable. To what you are. Repentance is an action. It's not just like, oh, oh, I'm sorry for what I did again. No, it's it's action moving forward. What are we going to do? It's leaving everything behind to come to the waters of Christ. And this is a water baptism. He, he, was, he was known as John the Baptizer. He was, he was baptizing people. And this water baptism is not the same as ours. You know, I, I, I've thought about this before. It's like, how is he baptizing people? I, I don't understand why John the Baptist is baptizing people before Jesus. This was a baptism of repentance. This was an identification as a person with a need to get right with God and be cleansed. That's what baptism meant. To us, baptism is now we identify with Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection. That's what baptism means to us. So we, that's, why we, that's why we dunk, all right? So this is however we do it, right? So right here, I was trying to figure that out. Death, burial, and resurrection. So we say we baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Death, burial, and the water and then resurrection. And what we're signifying, we are identifying with Christ that we are a new creation. The old self is dead and the new is resurrected with Jesus Christ. We are a brand new creation. This was, this was saying that I identify as a person with a need to get right with God. Th- this would often happen for a, a heathen Gentile person that wanted to become Jewish. They would have a baptism ceremony. This was typically done for, for Gentiles wanting to enter into Judaism. So to have some, some Jewish people get baptized, to have Jewish people get baptized, it was an odd thing. For a Jewish person to be baptized, it would be like saying they are as bad as a heathen Gentile. They also need repentance. And if you know anything, they don't really want to be compared to Gentiles, especially heathen Gentiles, which is pretty much every Gentile, right? They, but, but there was a baptism of repentance that John the Baptist was calling to him to them to. There was something about the way in which he lived his life outside of society, as an outcast, basically, saying, I'm not going to have any part of society. And if you want to come be a part of what God is doing, you come out of the society and you come into what God is doing. Now you might go back into society, but not to be a part of it, not to live it, not to be, not to be identified with that. You are now identified as having to live for God, but now you're going to go back in with a, with a different mission, with a different mindset.
And so that's what the Jewish people were doing. That's what John the Baptist was preaching. That's why he lived where he lived. It was an entire analogy. It was an entire parable for how today, for us as Christians, how we should live our lives. Verse 4. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled and every mountain and hill, hill shall be made low and the crooked shall become straight and the rough places shall become level ways and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. God is going to do the work that no man could. Man, every valley is going to be filled. Every mountain and hill shall be made low. It's going to be a flat and level surface. And the crooked shall become straight. There's so many crooked ways in which we can live our lives. But God calls us to live true and straight. And the rough places shall become level ways. Like driving down the road in Michigan with all the potholes, right? It's tough to drive down those roads. God's going to make it straight. God's going to make it level. God's going to not let there be hills and valleys, but it's just going to be a consistent, straight path forward. Only God is going to be able to do that. God is going to do the work that no man could ever do. And he says that all flesh shall see the salvation of God. All flesh. When God died on the cross and rose again three days later, it counted for you. All flesh. This wasn't just a a, a select few. This wasn't just the chosen people of of Judaism, the Jewish people of Israel. This was going to be for all flesh. Any man, woman, child can come to know Jesus Christ personally. It's inclusive of all, but exclusively through Jesus Christ. He said, therefore, to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, you brood of vipers who warned you to, <clears throat> to flee from the wrath to come, bear fruits in keeping with repentance and do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father, for I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now the ax is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Now, now John never went to preaching school, preaching 101, neither did I. So we have that in common. But preaching 101 would tell you this, don't start out your sermons by calling them snakes, brood of vipers, like sons of snakes, which is a pretty offensive term, and asking them, why are you even here? That's how John starts out his message. (laughs) You brood of vipers, you snakes, you, 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 you people of venomous snakes, you children of venomous snakes, who warned you to flee from the wrath? Why are you even out here? Who told you to come out here anyway? You don't have to be here. Go back to your homes. <laughs> it got him right on edge, didn't it? Man, John was weird. John was weird, and he was the one who was going to announce Jesus. He was the one. He he didn't have the social training. He didn't have all the qualifications. He didn't have everything. But he was called by God to go and be a part of this thing, to make the path, to make way for Jesus Christ, to, to, to uh, the voice calling out from the wilderness, to make a way for Jesus Christ to come in, to, that, that a Savior is coming. He was the, the, the hype man for Jesus coming out. This dude who's calling everybody a brood of vipers, <clears throat> Who's telling them, you know, why are you even out here? You don't even have to be out here right now. Why are you here? This is the guy that's calling him out. And for some reason, for some reason, people keep coming to John the Baptist, probably because he was a weirdo. And people were just like, you got to go see this guy, John, man. He's he's insane. He's going to call you something. It's like those shock comics that are just going to make fun of people all the time. Don't sit in the front row if you ever go to a comedy show, right? Because they're going to make fun of you, uh, uh, probably if you're in the front row, right? He's just going after him. And, and, he's, and he's not mincing any words. 
man, sometimes we dance around topics. We dance around subjects, especially in our Christian circles. I don't want to offend. I don't want to whatever. Man, sometimes we got to get right to the heart of the issue. Why are you even here? What's your motive for being here? Are you, are, are you here to grow your business? Are you here just to, for some little self-help, uh, make you feel better to get through the week? Maybe it's just like you feel like this is some sort of penance that, I mean, and sometimes my sermons can feel that way, right? <laughs> it's like, I just got to endure it, you know? Why are you here? Who warned you to, to flee from the wrath to come? Now he says to bear fruit in keeping with repentance. All right, you guys are repenting. You guys are being baptized. You better bear fruit in keeping with that repentance. Man, are we bearing fruit that's, that's, that's in keeping uh, uh, of true repentance? We go to Galatians often, Galatians 5, which, which gives the, the, um, the works of the flesh versus the fruit of the Spirit. <clears throat> Enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of rage, sexual immorality, all these things are, 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 are things that are, are, are going to be byproducts of the works of the flesh. Those are not works of, of, of the fruit of true repentance. Those are not the fruit of repentance. Those are the fruit of flesh. The fruit of true repentance is what the Holy Spirit gives us, which is love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, gentleness, uh, faithfulness, and self-control. I don't know if I missed one. That's, that's what repentance looks like. Bear the fruit of true repentance. And keep in mind, man, it doesn't start with who you are. The minute we start thinking about who we are and I deserve and I believe and I think, that's when the works of the flesh are going to start coming out. That's when fits of rage are going to start coming out. That's when sexual immorality is going to come. Well, I deserve this. I'm owed this. I'm the king of the castle. I'm the king of the mountain. I get what I want. We talked about this last week, just about who, whose business are you about right now? Be careful saying, uh, I, I'm owed, I get, I deserve. The people in this time, they could puff their chests out a little bit because they're Jewish. Man, they're from Israel. They're from Abraham. And John here is saying, man, be careful. Don't begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our, fa as our father. Don't, don't believe that you're owed anything because of who your dad is. Don't believe that you're owed anything because of who you are. But, but because of whose you are, we have a posture of humility. We, it's not about who I am anymore. It's about whose I am. And, and, and if I belong to someone, that means everything is about them. It's not about Abraham. Man, we're, we're not in Camp Abraham. We're not in Camp David. We're not in Camp uh, Israel. Man, we're in Camp Jesus now. Be careful about who you think you are. And whose you are is what matters. Jesus says that he is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through him. Man, it isn't through Abraham anymore. It's through Jesus Christ. He's the way. He can't be the way if he's not also the truth and the life. He can't know the way if he's not the truth. And, and if he's not true, that means he's not the way or the life. And if he doesn't have life, then he doesn't have truth, and he's certainly not the way. Jesus says, I am the way. Are you lost? Follow me. I am the truth. Are you confused about life around you? Are you, are you confused about what's, what's real and what's not and, and what actual absolute truth is? Man, look to Jesus Christ because he is truth. He doesn't have some truth to depart on us. He is the truth. And if we remain in him, we are true to Jesus Christ. And I am the life. I am the life. You follow him, you listen to his truth, and you live the truth of Jesus Christ, then you're going to have an abundant life. Jesus promised us that, that, that 
we will have, that he's come to give us life and give it to the full, to give it to the extreme. That means that when we are found in Jesus Christ, when we align ourselves with Jesus Christ, when we are, when it's more about whose we are rather than who we are, we're going to stop searching around for all of these different things. We're going to separate ourselves from society. We're going to be in the wilderness of repentance where the, where, where the, where the life of Jesus Christ fills us up because we don't have any of these other distractions. John left the society so that he could completely focus on God and he's calling others to do it as well. Man, when we focus only on Jesus Christ, when we focus on him, our lives make sense. We have true repentance. We come to him and we're like, man, everything I have is worth nothing in comparison to who you are. That's what the apostle Paul writes, right? Man, I, I, I compare everything a loss for the surpassing greatness of knowing Jesus Christ as my Lord. It, it, everything is a loss. There's, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an uh, accounting term where you've got this ledger, a profit and loss statement. And on the loss statement is everything that you've ever accomplished in life on your own merit. And then in the profit section is just Jesus Christ. It's just the cross and his resurrection. That's the only thing that's on the profit. Are you living that way right now? I can tell you I'm not. I have a hard time living that way because I, say, well, I don't think that, you know, watching football is a loss. I don't think that growing this church is a loss. I don't think, no, if I'm doing it for me, it's a loss. And this doesn't mean I can't enjoy those things. God gives us things to enjoy, but am I aligned with him? Or am I trying to find life in football? Am I trying to find life in building this church? Am I trying to find life in, in, in whatever job it is that I get to do? Or am I finding life in all? only Jesus Christ. Church, I, I, I implore you to find life in Jesus Christ. He says he is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. And no one is going to come to the Father except through him. It's not through Abraham. No one comes to the Father except through him. And it's not through Muhammad. It's not through Gandhi. It's not through Buddha. It's not through enlightenment it's through Jesus Christ and if you got a problem with that you got a problem with Jesus not me he's the one who said it he said it to his disciples in John uh, I believe it was John 14 I am the way the truth and the life Jesus just can't be a good teacher if he's just a good teacher, he, he's, he's not God. And if he's not God, then he's not a good teacher because he claimed to be the son of God. He claims that he is the way, the truth, and the life. And if he's not that, then he's, he's a liar or a lunatic. It's a C.S. Lewis quote. Jesus is either a liar, a lunatic, or God himself. There's, there's no middle ground when it comes to Jesus. Where have you put him? Where are you making him out to be? What are you making him out to be? Is he the savior of your life? Is he the way, the truth, and the life? Or is he just, a, you know, somewhere in the mix with your job, with your, with your friends, with your family? Oh, man, I encourage you guys to lay it all aside and just follow him. So John says that anything that doesn't bear good fruit is going to be cut down and thrown into the fire, which is also what Jesus shares in that same upper room. Verse 10, and the crowds asked him, what then shall we do? How do we live this way? What are we, how, how, how are we supposed to respond? Which I love this. I mean, if you're a preacher, you, you love having somebody ask, well, then what shall we do? We hear what you're saying. Now, what should we do with it? What's the application? They're tracking with him, and he answered them. Whoever has two tunics to share with them, who has none? Or, I'm sorry, let me read that again. Whoever has two tunics is to share with him who has none, and whoever has food is to do likewise. Tax collectors also came to be baptized and said to him, Teacher, what shall we do? And he said to them, Collect no more than you are authorized to do. Soldiers also asked him, And we, what shall we do? And he said to them, do not extort money from anyone by, by threats or by false accusations and be content with your wages. He's saying, guys, look at their, the, our faith in Christ is evident by our works for others. 
Our faith in Christ is evident by our works for others. And, 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 and I want to go through a list of things of what that means by our faith in Christ as evident by our works for others. God cares about how we treat one another. When we come to Jesus Christ, it doesn't just mean that vertically we're good with him now. Now it means that we, as much as we are able to, as much as we can control, to live peaceably with everyone and to give generously, to live generously. That's the very first thing that that John the Baptist is saying. This is out of his mouth, not mine. I'm not trying to get Restoration Church more money. I'm trying to get the church to be generous. That's it. I don't I don't care about Restoration Church money. I mean, I do a little, but this is not the case. I want a giving church out and about to people around you. If you see somebody that's got two, if you've got two tunics, you know, a shirt. If you got two shirts and you see somebody walking around without a shirt, man, give them a shirt. If there's people who need something, share it. I just, I'm, I'm blown away constantly about how socialist this, this lifestyle is right? Capitalism is great. Don't, I'm not dogging it as a political thing, as a culture, as, as whatever. All I'm saying is that we as Christians should put it on ourselves to, to give it all away. Whatever we gain, we should just be able to give right back out because it's not ours to begin with, because he is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. If I'm getting my life out of all the money that I have and all the stuff that I have, then I'm not going to be giving it away. I'm going to be holding it like this. But if I believe that Jesus Christ is the life, he is the way, and he is the truth, man, then I'm, 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 I don't care what possessions I have. I'm just going to give it away because why do I need it? How, how, how am I to say that I need this more than that person does? Live generously. And part of that, yes, is the church. It says in 1 Corinthians 16, this is Paul writing, Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I directed the churches of Galatia, so you also are to do. On the first day of every week, each of you is to put something aside and store it up, as he may prosper, so that there will be no collecting when I come. Live generously. He's saying, take up an offering. Now specifically, they were going to give it to Jerusalem, the church in Jerusalem, because they were... uh, foolishly giving too much away. They were just like, God's coming back. Jesus is coming back anytime now. We're just going to just just uh, recklessly give everything away. And, 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 and they're like, we well, probably should have kept some of that just so we can, you know, keep going on. And they were, they were poor. So they were taking a collection up every single week. They said, hey, on the first day of the week when you guys gather for church, take a collection up and we're going to make sure we, it goes to where it needs to go. We do the exact same thing today. Live generously. So we can give corporately as the church together to help support the church because it's an act of worship, because it's not mine anyway. It's not yours anyway. And so we just give. I I give to Restoration Church. It's it's part of my my tithing. Well, why do you give? You just get paid. Because it's not about the money. It's about the act of giving. Live generously. And then with one another, man, if you see somebody who needs food, give them food. If you see, need, see somebody who needs something, uh, housing, if you see somebody who needs um, clothing, man, fill the need. Just this week, we helped pay for rent. Uh, we're probably going to be able to pay for another person's rent. Like We love to give out out of our benevolent account. Live generously. Matthew 25, Jesus says this, Uh, Starting in verse 35, for I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them truly. I say to you, listen to this, what that means. As you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. Man, we find life in Jesus Christ. We live generously. Next thing after living generously is we live honestly. Those tax collectors came by and they're like, okay, we want to get baptized too, but what does this mean for us? What is baptism of, of repentance? What, is this, what does this look like? What are the action steps now for us? We got to go back into society. So what does that mean? And, and John just says, hey, collect the tax, but don't be unfair. Trust God with everything. Live honestly. Live honestly. 
Don't get too caught up in, in trying to get ahead for yourself. See, when we think that we are the life, when we are the way, and when we are the truth, we're going to start fudging some numbers so that we can get a little bit more ahead. When it's all about my kingdom, my building, my life, my, 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 my. We, we start thinking, okay, I need to do this to get ahead. I need to make sure I take care of this. I need to make sure I take care of this. And I need to make sure I take care of this. And we don't live honestly. And it's going to come back to bite us. You may think you're getting away with it for a, for a time, but you're not going to. Everybody's going to have to come and pay at some point. Live honestly. I got to hustle. Next thing is to live humbly. Man, live humbly. Saying don't... He, he tells the soldiers... Don't extort money from anyone by threats or false accusations. Man, live humbly. Look at the life of Jesus Christ. Look at how he lived his life. I, I, I think back to John chapter 13. I know we go a lot to the upper room today. But John chapter 13, Jesus bends down. He takes off his outer robe. He puts on a servant's towel uh, <clears throat> and... and, and um, and begins washing the disciples' feet, which takes even more precedent when you, when you understand that washing of the feet, what it meant in this culture, means that you're literally washing crap off of their feet. Because there's no mode of transportation other than animals that will drop some things, uh, much like you see at Mackinac Island, right? You go to Mackinac Island, you got to watch your step. And, and now consider this, it's Passover week, there's 200,000 people in the city, and, and there's a lot more uh, crap all around the city, all on, on the roads, everywhere, on the, on the paths, wherever you are, there's going to be crap. And also, there's that many more people. Man, there's not very much um, uh, plumbing, public plumbing, or, 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 or like modern plumbing. You know, there's not that. So basically, all you're doing is you're throwing it out the window, basically. That's what plumbing looks like. And so you're stepping in, in human crap. You're stepping in, in animal crap. Your feet are covered in it. It's not just mud. It's not just dirt. It's not just dust. But it's literal crap. And Jesus is going around the table from, to each one of them who refused to wash each other's feet, by the way. When they went into the, to the upper room, nobody was there to wash their feet. And so they just started doing it because they didn't want to be the one that would be known as the foot washer. So Jesus takes off his, his outer robe, puts on a servant's robe, and he just starts washing feet, washing the crap, kneeling down and washing the, washing the disciples' feet. He washes Judas' feet. He knows what Judas is about to do. He knows that he's about to betray him, but he still washes Judas' feet. That's humility. So Restoration Church, whose feet are we unwilling to wash? Our pride gets in the way. Lastly, is to live contently. The last thing he says to those soldiers, he doesn't say leave your vocation. He doesn't say leave it all behind. He's saying act differently in your business world. Act differently in your jobs. Be a different person. Be content with your wages. Don't try to get more money for your wages from all these people. Man, just, just be content. And again, we only find that when we find our freedom in Jesus Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life. If I'm content, I'm, I'm happy with whatever I've got because I know I don't deserve anything. Hebrews 13.5 writes, Keep your life free from love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Do you believe this morning that Jesus Christ will never leave you nor forsake you? That he's going to give you everything that you need to get through life? Or are we building our own kingdoms? Our faith in Christ is evident by our works for others. That means we live generously, we live honestly, we live humbly, and we live contently. Let's finish the story out. As the people were in expectation and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Christ, they were starting to think, maybe, maybe this is the one, maybe this is the Messiah. John answered them all, 
<clears throat> saying, I baptize you with water, but he who is mightier than I is coming, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. So with many other exhortations, he preached good news to the people. That was good news to the people. And they, they started wondering, man, maybe this is the Christ. Maybe this is our Messiah. Maybe he's the one. And John could have gone and run with that. John could have let this all get to his head. He had been hurt. He'd been told since the beginning of his life that he was going to be something, that he was going to prepare the way for, for one even greater than he. And some people might hear that and be like, no, no, no. I want to be the greatest in my life. I want to be the one that, that, that wins this. I want to be the one with notoriety. And, and, and John, knowing that this is what they're about to say, knowing that they're starting to question these things, he just cuts it off right away. And he's like, no, 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 no. It's not about me. Yeah, these, there's a lot of crowds coming. There's a lot of people coming, but this is not about me. Which means our works for others point to our faith in Christ. Our works for others point to our faith in Christ. John's saying, there's somebody mightier than me coming. And listen, I am not even worthy to untie the, the sandals of his straps. Basically, the, the straps on the sandals. If this is a cultural thing. R rabbis in this time could pretty much require anything of their disciples, but they would never ask them to loosen their sandal straps. It was deemed too humiliating. You would, no, 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 you don't need to do that. Which again, makes Jesus washing their feet even more incredible. And John is saying, man, I'm not even worthy to do the most unthinkable thing for Jesus. I, I, I'm not even worthy to untie his shoes, something that no one would ask any disciple to do. And I'm not even worthy of that. There's somebody coming that's much more greater than I. In John chapter 3, verse 30, it says that John the Baptist says that the, 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 the crowds are starting to follow Jesus more. There's a little bit later on. The crowds are starting to follow Jesus. His ministry is dwindling down. His church is shrinking. And he's like, man, I must decrease and he must increase. And that's the posture in which he lives his lives, his life. Our works for others point to our faith in Christ, not in how good we are, not in how much we've accomplished. Don't keep track of that stuff. Because then you're just pointing to yourself. John is saying, I'm going to baptize with water, but he who comes is going to baptize in the Spirit and with fire. We're baptized with the Holy Spirit from the moment we accept Jesus Christ as our Savior. I know there's some theologies out there that believe in a second baptism or even a third baptism of the Holy Spirit. Then you're going to get this gift of speaking in tongues. I, I, I don't see it in Scripture. I see it a couple times maybe in the book of Acts. That's a historical thing. It doesn't mean today. When you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, you are indwelled with the Holy Spirit. Now, there is a fullness of the Holy Spirit. You can be filled, continually be filled with the Holy Spirit, or you can neglect the Holy Spirit, right? Now, there's that sort of thing that's happening. But to say another baptism of the Holy Spirit, that's just not there. We get filled with the Holy Spirit. We come closer to Jesus, and the Holy Spirit fills our lives even more. Or, or we walk away from it a little bit more, and then we don't hear from the Holy Spirit as much. Not because he's not talking, but because we're not listening. We're baptized with the Holy Spirit. We are a brand new creation. That means death, burial, resurrection, uh, which is just a symbol, mind you, just a symbol. We don't get the baptism. We don't get the Holy Spirit when we're baptized. We get the Holy Spirit when we accept Jesus Christ, and we are made a brand new creation. We're, we're something brand new, and we take away everything else. We allow God to take away all the things that don't matter now. And that's a bold prayer to, 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 to pray, to take away all that is unnecessary and leave only that which edifies and grows me. Lord, take it all away. He's got the winnowing fork in his hand to clear his threshing floor. That was where you would, um, a winnowing fork, you would, you would lift up the, the, the wheat uh, and the outer covering of, of the wheat um, there was a loose outer covering of the wheat was the chaff and you would lift it up into the ground and uh, off of the ground, you'd, you'd, with a winnowing fork, you'd just throw it up into the air. And, and as the, the, the wheat fell down because it was heavier, the chaff would, would blow away. He's got the winnowing fork in his hand and he's lifting us up. He's clearing his threshing floor. 
to gather the wheat into his barn and the things that are left behind, he's going to burn with an unquenchable fire. He's going to baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His fire is a purifying fire. 1 John 1, 9 says to purify us from all unrighteousness. It, it just means that like, and when, when you would you would put precious metals into this 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 refining fire, it it would get away all of the impurities. All the impurities come to the top, and you just scoop them off. So that what's left is this pure thing, and that fire is hotter than hot. Man, when we accept Jesus Christ as our Savior, when we believe that He is the way, the truth, and the life, it means that we are baptized with Him in the Holy Spirit. We get the Holy Spirit in our lives, and He's gonna like fire, like like on the threshing floor. He's gonna He's gonna take what all the good stuff that stays, and everything else He's gonna just take apart. And He's gonna burn it up. So Restoration Church, here's what I'm saying. Give it all up. Give it all up. You may think, well, then I'm just going to have nothing. If I give it all up, I'm just, I'm, 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 there, there's going to be nothing left. And I know that's scary, but that's exactly where God starts working. He's not going to force his way into something. He's going to allow you to do it. But that's the next step that we've got to take. It's all or it's nothing. And there might be a brief moment where it looks like we're in a desert. But if I take it all away, then I'm, if he takes it all away, I'm going to have nothing. But once that's all cleared out, once, once all the, the, the stuff is cleared out, his spring of living water is going to come bursting forth into your life and, and, and you will never be thirsty again. John the baptizer was calling for a baptism of repentance and I'm calling for the same thing. The analogy of his life of going out into the wilderness, living in the wilderness, being set aside from the culture, not not impacted by the culture, but just being John the Baptist, fully focused on God. That's the call for our lives too. We start with a clean slate. We take it all away and we just say, God, okay, I'm ready for you. Some of us have been striving and trying for so long to, to come up with, with a way to make our lives make sense. And it just doesn't make sense, does it? God wants us to start with a clean slate out in the desert and the wilderness of forgiveness and repentance. And let his spring of water fill our lives. That's what Jesus said to the woman at the well, right? He knew her whole life. He knew everything about her. And he said, leave that all behind. Come take a drink from my living water and you will never be thirsty again. Stop striving. Stop trying to be. And just abide. John 15. I, I've said the rest of the... <laughs> of the upper room. I might as well do this one too. John 15, abide, remain, 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 remain in him. And watch how you find your way. Watch how you find his truth. Watch how you find his life. And then our works for others point to our faith in Christ Jesus. It's not about me anymore. It's about him. Father God, would you please work in our lives? God, I pray for anyone who's listening to this who might not know who you are. God, who, who is holding something back, I pray that you would just supernaturally reach through it, God, and just impact their hearts. God, give them the courage to give it all up for you. God, I pray for those who haven't accepted you as their Savior, God, that we would believe that when your son died on the cross, it counted for me. 
it counted for us. God, we would come to you and repent. We would turn from our lifestyle of sin and we would live in a lifestyle that is befitting of you as your sons and daughters. God, thank you for this time that we get to worship. Spend some time focused on you. That's in your name. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.